Patty Martell, supervisor and producer at CNBC and the moderator of today's Women in Wealth live stream. We want to empower women to be better investors and make informed financial decisions. But before we get started with today's conversation, I want to remind you that CNBC's Virtual Financial Advisor Summit is taking place on June 15th, where you'll hear from top advisors, investors, and market experts discussing the market risks ahead, potential buying opportunities, and tools advisors can use to generate consistent returns while minimizing the downside. Scan the QR code on the screen to register or visit cnbcevents.com slash financial advisor. My guest today is Brittany bowles Moeller. She is the Southeast Region Head at Goldman Sachs Private Wealth Management, where she also leads the bank's strategy for engaging the next generation of investors. Brittany, welcome. Thank you, Patty. Great to be here. Let's start with the investing landscape. This is an interesting time in the market. On the one hand, we have stubbornly high inflation, high interest rates, a Federal Reserve that is still very much engaged in fighting inflation. But on the other hand, you have low unemployment um, and what some people have called the beginning of a new bull market for stocks. I mean, even your colleague David Costin just raised his year end target for the S&P 500. So how are you advising clients in this environment? Great point, Patty. And you're right. There's no shortage of topics we could cover here. When we came out with our annual outlook in January, uh, the cover said, caution, heavy fog. And I, I think, you know, unfortunately, there's still some fog out there. You, you named several of the themes that we talk to clients about constantly. You know, despite the volatility and the challenges over the last year, our clients have generally remained disciplined, calm, uh, focused on the long run. So in line with our investment strategy group's guidance, you know, we are really encouraging clients to remain invested in developed equities. Now, developed equities have done well this year. The stock market's up, as you mentioned. Uh, we just entered into a bull market last week. Um, we'll see how that goes. And there's no shortage of risks out there. There's a constant focus on recession. Um, all eyes are on the Fed tomorrow. So there's a lot to sift through. And what we're really focused on helping clients do is take a step back. When it comes to successful investment outcomes, the most important action you can take is really to have a solid investment strategy. And that includes a, a diversified mix of assets that help you grow your assets over time, that importantly um, help you sustain during periods of market volatility, and that provide you with a lifestyle that you are looking for. So at the end of the day, it's about having that right strategy. And when you have that right strategy, the next focus remains on staying to it. So there's a behavioral finance aspect of this. And we have a framework actually that we often go through with clients, which is, you know, how do you remain committed to the long term? So if you look at, as an example, the S&P 500 over the long run, um, over the last 20 years, the cumulative return of the S&P 500 is something like 548%. So that's 9.8% annualized. Now let's say over 20 years, you miss the best 10 days in the market. That's just 0.2% of trading days. Your return drops from 9.8% to actually 5.6%. So a dramatic decrease. Now let's take out the best 50 days across that 50, that 20 year time frame. That's just 1% of trading days across that time. And yet your return drops from 9.8% annualized actually to a negative 2.7%. So our advice you know, often for clients is really let's strategy. And our clients in this environment have remained, as I mentioned, very disciplined and very calm. And that's that's good advice, because although it feels painful in the moment, you know, this year the market is up significantly. But last year it was down a lot. It was down double digits. Um, and we're investors, not traders. And uh, no one can call the bottom and no one can call the top. And that's why it's important to, to be patient and be, to be disciplined and to continue contributing, right? Like, what do you, do you get um, clients calling that are panicking? You know, they see maybe the, the value of their portfolio um, going down and what do you say to them? You know, Patty, it, that's a good question. And certainly I'd say for clients who have 
recently, less as an example, sold their business. And all of a sudden, the value of that business has all of a sudden become liquid wealth. You do have a period of adjustment. Um, but what we go back to at the end of the day is we've agreed upon a really long-term strategy. In the beginning of these conversations, we always stress test them. So we actually take them through periods of economic distress to see how those portfolios would have behaved. And we remind them that we construct diversified portfolios where you actually don't need to sell when markets are going down. So it's very much about having confidence, again, in that long-term strategy. Um, like we said, the, the uncertainty can be stressful like when you're in the moment. Um, and women tend to be more risk averse. Um, what, are, what are some of the primary focuses, though, for female investors? I'm, I'm so glad we're talking about women and investing because, and you said this concept risk averse. So um, our colleague, Mina Flynn, I, I love something that she says. Mina is our global co-head of private wealth and um, management. And she says, you know, women are not actually more risk averse. They are more risk aware, which means they want to understand what are the potential outcomes of an investment strategy and how does that really fit into our overall goals? And so I think women, I totally agree with that. I think women clients are incredible investors and many of them take a goals-based investing approach where they actually take all of the numbers and the data, the asset classes, the statistics, and they use that as a tool to achieve very long-term tangible goals. So, so to give you an example, um, we have clients who tell us they want to provide for the, the futures of their children and grandchildren. And that could be from um, helping them pay for their education. It could be buying a first house. It could be starting a business. And at the end of the day, um, all of the work around the investing is actually tied back to those really important goals that the client set forward. And I, I hope we'll get to this. Um, in that means you have to have a team of advisors around you who are listening to those goals and really paying attention to what matters to you as a client. Yeah, that's actually a really important point because it's important to have a financial advisor um, who is a fiduciary, who is someone that you like and someone that you trust, uh, someone that should answer all of your questions um, and help really help guide you on this financial journey. I totally agree. We talk about this all the time with, with by the way, um, all of our clients, men and women, which is the importance of your team. We typically say a, a really good team includes an excellent accountant, a really amazing attorney and a really amazing wealth manager. And I was actually just talking to a group of women founders about this and, you know, they're running their own businesses. They're busy. Like what, how could I possibly find the time to actually sit down and, and invest and develop that team? And what we walked through was a good team pays for itself. It saves you time. It simplifies your life. And so what we came to is, you know, really running a process, actually looking at a number of firms in each of those categories uh, in the case of a wealth manager, you want to tell them a little bit about your goals, you know, what's important to you, and then have them actually construct portfolios based on those goals. And, and what that does is it shows you you're watching. Are they responsive? You know, are they truly listening to me? Do I do I feel comfortable asking them any any question? When we did an internal survey of our clients, we asked them, you know, what's most important about a relationship with Goldman Sachs Private Wealth Management? And by far no surprise. It's having these trusted, solid relationships. So I really encourage everyone to start investing in how to develop that team of advisors around you because it's crucial to really good outcomes. And again, it simplifies your life. That's a good point because at the end of the day, you are paying your financial advisor um, So, and they should really be working um, for you. But a good point um, also is that um, a good advisor that is listening is not only going to answer your questions, but also anticipate some of the things that you don't know, right? Like you don't know what you don't know and, um, and they do. And that's why it's important to have a great relationship and have someone that you can talk to um, and someone that is going to help you even so you don't feel uncomfortable and you don't feel embarrassed saying, you know, I don't understand that or help or walk me through that. Or, you know, I, I, I don't know what that is. Um, because, you know, I, it's easy to feel, it's easy to feel, you know, a little embarrassed that, you know, we're professionals and you feel like you should know these things, but, you know, having this holistic approach to managing your wealth and your assets, um, it can be very complicated. It can, uh, you know, this really reminds me of, um, 
several years ago, there was this growing body of research and it suggested exactly what you're saying. It suggested that wealth management wasn't working for women. And there were a number of reasons for this. Um, one of the research points was, uh, you know, women had historically been under targeted by wealth management firms. So they didn't have the familiarity around sort of high quality investment opportunities that their male counterparts might have. Uh, there's this really staggering statistic, great research by, I think it was McKinsey in this, in this instance, which said that in the unfortunate circumstance of a male spouse passing away, 70% of the time, the surviving female spouse chooses not to work with her husband's advisors. And I think it's that. It, they were her husband's advisors. They weren't her advisors. She didn't have that relationship. So several years ago, again, we started really looking at that research. We talked to a number of our women clients. We did a big sort of internal analysis around this. And amongst an amazing group of colleagues, we came to this aha moment, which is um, we should provide our women clients with the option to have a distinct offering and experience that's built just for them. So for us, that's called In the Lead. We're really proud of this work. Um, it's very tied to having a community of women clients who can ask those questions of one another, by the way, uh, and be a sounding board and a board of advisors and a, and a network of friends. It's a, Obviously, it's about investing. So access to investment opportunities. But Patty, what you said, which is let's help people expand their knowledge of investing, whether they are a day one investor or a professional investor. You know, there's something for everybody. And then finally, it's about this concept of resources for the family, for governance that really create long term sustainable outcomes for our families and for our clients. So in the lead was was a, a really a product of a lot of what you're talking about. And be mindful of having just like you make your annual doctor's appointment to get your physical like have an annual checkup with your financial advisor um, to make sure that you're on the right track your your goals are being met or you're on the path to meeting those goals um because what you may have had in place you know in your early 30s is is going to be different at you know could be different at 35 and 40 and 45 a lot happens in you know in that chunk of a woman's time um a, a, a chunk of a woman's life right like there could be um marriage um there could be children um you could get a, a new job and all of these things um could impact um your financial plan that's very true. Um, in fact, a lot of our work, you mentioned at the front end, we're really focused on thinking about the next generation of wealth decision makers. And, and part of that is, as you're describing, there are these huge dynamics changing around who owns wealth. So over the next 20 years, uh, $84 trillion will change hands from one generation to the next, which essentially means in the next you know, 10 to 15 years, Gen X and millennials will be the majority owners of that inherited wealth. At the same time, women now control more wealth than ever. By 2030, we believe women will have something like $30 trillion of assets in their control. That's because they're both creating wealth more often and they are recipients of that inherited wealth. And, and those dynamics and family ownership of wealth are really impacting something else, which is almost independent, which is the needs and preferences of new investors, that group that you mentioned, the 30 and 40 year old, the wealth creators and the inheritors who are coming into this position of needing to actually make key decisions around this. That generation of investors simply has different needs and preferences uh, than prior generations. They are more digital. They are more diverse. Uh, they are demanding more from firms like ours in terms of what they need from us. Uh, we are essentially their client's family office. We serve more comprehensive services outside of just investing. Um, and finally, and I love this shift, we are increasingly hired not just to be one person's point of contact with the family, but we are increasingly having clients tell us they are hiring Goldman Sachs because Goldman is great for me as an individual and Goldman is amazing for my family. So it's about, again, those resources for the spouses and, and the children around that. And at the same time of all of that work sort of happening, and you're talking about these big life events occurring, you know, our job is really to examine those changes and embrace them. So we're looking at every part of our client offering and looking to ensure that we are setting up our clients in the context of those changing needs and preferences to have very long-term, successful, multi-generational outcomes. And helping um, investors, you know, male and female, like have these conversations with their children, right? It should be 
um, a family affair. They should understand um, how the wealth is being managed, whether um, there is charitable giving, like where it's what your plans are, um, you know, to let's be open about talking about money and talking about investing. Yes, and this is key, Patty, to have a successful multi-generational outcome. Um, our clients, male and female, are laser focused on how do you prepare the next generation to thrive financially, to be really comfortable and responsible with the wealth that they have, no matter what level of wealth. Um, and really, this all starts with a very good plan. For a lot of our clients, that's a trust and estate plan. And that's basically a way to take the family's values, what matters most to a family, and actually codify that so that your long-term intentions are put on paper. And I think there's a view that the trust and estate planning world is only for a certain level of wealth. And actually, a good trust and estate plan, I think, is applicable to everyone. Because again, it just takes your really long-term intentions and it puts it down on paper. When we asked our clients, it was an internal survey we did, uh, our women clients, we asked them, you know, of all the things we can talk about, of all the things we can cover, what do you want to hear from us on? And the number one topic was trust and estate planning. So it just goes to show you how critical that work is. And then once that plan is in place, it's really about how do you start to talk about these values and how you start that education process. And the values for a family will vary. Um, I once had a client tell me that I was a husband and wife. They had two daughters and the daughters were young. And their purpose at that point in time, how they codified their family values was to say all of the educational choices for the girls, um, how they spent their time as a family, the vacations that they went on. It was all to help their daughters pursue a profession that gave them purpose. That was their value set. And I love that. Um, and so really, we see our clients starting to talk to their children about money and um, just good practices around finances pretty early on. I have two young girls. You know, we're in the land of like piggy bank lessons, so it's nothing sophisticated. Um, they're a little young for that. But certainly as children get older, we often see clients setting them up for their very first investment portfolio. We are helping them pick a few stocks. The kids get super excited about those companies. They read about them in the news. They get to see their performance. And, you know, slowly along the way, you evolve that teaching. So we have an entire team at Goldman that's just dedicated to this. It's just focused on how we help our clients and their children really prepare for the future and to build on their knowledge set over the years. You made um, an interesting point just a moment ago, and I just want to go back because I think it's important um, you, when you talk about, you know, people may not think that, um, you know, estate planning um, is right for them. When you think about, you know, certain parts, certainly here in New York, um, your home value may have gone up a lot in the last couple of years, right? And that's, you should be mindful of that, that, um, you know, that is all part, these are all parts of your assets. Absolutely. It's not just what's it's a great your, point. Right, it's not and real estate, you know, New York real estate, depending on when you bought, um, really amazing investment, right? Amazing long-term investment. Mm -hmm. We are often in the position of helping our clients look at their whole balance sheet. And for a lot of our clients, they own private real estate. Um, they may, may actually still own a, a, a part of a business. Um, they may still operate that business. And um, mapping all of that out and actually putting analytics around how you think about your liquid wealth, i.e. your your investments that you can trade every single day to access if you need to. How do you think about that in context of your overall balance sheet? So it's a really good point, Patty. Um, you know, and I think real estate in particular, obviously, um, is an asset class that a lot of people are watching these days. I think uh, it's important to note that the market will go up and down. Interest rates really affect real estate. But the, but the long-term view is, yes, that's an important part of your overall balance sheet. You said something earlier about the changing dynamic um, in investing. And um, UBS had this report that came out this morning, and I thought it was the, the timing was perfect. It's called Tradition, Trust, and Time. But one of the stats in this report um, was is really interesting. They say that nearly 30% of the U.S. women uh, in, in relationships uh, now earn more than their spouse or partner. So more and more... Um, you know, women are the breadwinners in their families. Um, they are continuing, you know, to, to maybe work longer um, and either not have children or have children later. So their their wealth is really, um, it's really, their earnings power and their wealth is really accumulating like we have never really seen before. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we, we I mentioned that statistic earlier where women control more wealth now than ever, um, and that's only expected to increase. I think this concept of though the family dynamics, um, one of the things that we found really valuable about our work that's focused on, again, the next generation of wealth decision makers, those men and women in sort of their 30s and 40s. Um, and I'll, I'll just take a step back, an important distinction for us that we've learned actually from our clients is when we talk about multi-generational success, sometimes in our world, the term next gen comes up. And we've learned from our clients that it's actually, it's more important to see those clients for their forward ambitions rather than their source of wealth. And what that means is that everything that my team is doing, we're actually constructing resources and platform and looking at all of our work across the client offering um, and designing that for both wealth creators, wealth inheritors, and people who have overlap in both of those categories. And one key piece of this work, and I think a powerful output of changing our mindset around who is included in this target group that we're really focused on, is the power of that network. There's an incredible group of people who are surrounding, you know, sort of Goldman Sachs circles to help think through some of these topics that you're talking about, Patty. So we actually have, you know, a number of conferences, in-person events, um, ways to connect our clients over shared interest. And family dynamics and when you have children and how to talk to them about wealth, that is all part of it. And I think it really shows you the value of being part of, again, this concept of a community that we've learned from in the lead that we're now putting into place when it comes to this next generation of decision makers around wealth. So what are the strategies to prepare the next generation for wealth ownership? So we talked about a lot of it, you know, it starts with education. It can start really young. And so you don't have to feel like you have to have this big, heavy conversation where you um, reveal all of this information at a certain age. This, ideally, it builds upon one another. Um, I will say clients often tell us that a key value that they derive from our relationship is it is this concept of these conferences that we host for younger clients. Uh, maybe it's in their teens as they get to high school, going into college, because they actually create a peer network of people who are going through similar life stages and who have similar questions and, and they can learn from one another. So I think this, again, it, go, it goes back to education. Um, another key part of this is having really good advisors, again, thinking through um, who are the accountants and the attorneys and the wealth managers around the table. For us, you know, we have a concerted effort to really ensure that our clients are reflected in the teams in which they work with. And so often, we will actually have um, some new analysts joining us right out of college. Well, they can really relate to the younger clients, uh, the children of our clients in a way that maybe others of us can't. And so I think it's important to have your advisors play a role here. The final point I'll mention is on philanthropy. A lot of our clients really think about their um, their nonprofit work, the things that really make value for them in terms of the impact of their wealth. They think of that as being an incredible tool to start teaching their kids about being financial stewards. You know, many of our clients have been so blessed to have all of this wealth. We have the ability to actually change the world and do something good with that. And they get their kids involved with that work, um, both on a volunteer basis and actually going to projects and, you know, engaging in that hand to hand, um, but also in the way that they're giving of those resources resources and, and making donations. And But Brittany, what if you don't have generational wealth and maybe you are the person that is building, um, is building the wealth for your family and they're going to come to a financial advisor um, and it's their first time. What do they, what do they need to know? Or what, what, what are the questions they need to ask? Well, so that's a good point, Patty. The majority of our clients, um, are wealth creators. They've actually created their own wealth. They've started that business. And we start talking to them when, again, the majority of their balance sheet is actually in the company or it's in the real estate development. You know, it's not actually wealth that we might manage as a financial advisor. And so, you know, the questions that a person should be asking are the questions that we get all the time, which is, you know, what type of clients do you work with? How many clients do you work with? The many, the, the how number, how many um, clients, that is, a, that is a question around how many resources will I get? If I were to work with you and your team, how much time do you have for me? Um, how do you invest? Uh, they should ask questions around um, incentives. They should ask questions around the whole team. You know, you really want to think about hiring a team of people versus an individual. And I think at the end of the day, um, and, and this goes back to our prior conversation on assembling that team. What you really want to look for is you want to look for a group of people that you like and that you think you can have a trusted long-term relationship with. Because what we see with our clients, we may work with them um, 
for, for, you know, five, 10 years before they ever transact that business. They may sell that business. But during that time, we've built up so much trust and goodwill because we've helped them with tax planning. We've helped them think of through about capital raising. We've helped them think of through qualified small business stock for the, for their company. And all of that really builds on itself to show the capability and the time that we're investing in them. Um, so that hopefully when they do have some sort of transaction, there's no other firm that they would consider, you know, because we have built that, that trust and that relationship over those years. And just one more point that I want to make for people that are watching this, whether whether they're thinking about going to Goldman Sachs or to any other uh, firm or advisor, that financial advisors are not just for like the uber wealthy, the 1%, the top of the top, right? It's it's for anyone. Um, like you said, you have, you have some assets, you own your home, you may have, you know, a couple of homes, right? You don't have to be that top 1%. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, that, that goes back, that is absolutely critical, Patty. The worst thing would be, you know, the takeaway is um, you have to be at some wealth level to actually engage around that team that I'm talking about. Everyone can benefit from having that team. And it really starts to set the foundation. The earlier you start to assemble those pieces of the accountant, you know, who's going to help you with taxes and, and sort of someone to help you from a financial planning perspective, everything from cash flow and budgeting and preparing for big expenditures, whether that be, you know, something around um, your children's education or a purchase that you know that you need to make, that all falls within the realm of a really good trusted advisor. And there are so many amazing firms out there that do this work really well. That's all really great information, Brittany. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and thank you uh, for everyone that was watching. Uh, but once again, I do wanna remind you that there is still time to register for CNBC's Virtual Financial Advisor Summit. It is taking place on June 15th you can scan the QR code. You can scan the QR code that is on the screen right now or visit cnbcevents.com slash financial advisor. That does it for us. If you wanna see this video again or some of the other women and wealth interviews, go to cnbc.com slash women and wealth. Thank you everyone for, for joining us.